Uh, you know, this this is going to be very hard because uh, after I uh, left Congress, I became a teacher, and I I, I taught uh, at Harvard for 11 years, then I taught at Princeton, and when you, you know, those of you who are teachers know, you don't stand still and pray, I mean, how do I do this? But they, you know, I, I'm going to obey the rules and, and try to do it from here. I usually walk around, and I, I'd walk down the aisle if you had an aisle. I mean, if it were like the Congress, it would be a very wide aisle, and people on this side would not talk to the ones on that side, but, uh, but you know, I'll have to do it, I have to do it this way. Well, thank you very much for coming. I, I really appreciate the chance to, uh, to talk about my book and, and uh, my ideas, what led me to, to write this, and it's something that's been in my mind for a very long time. I'm going to kind of skip quickly and come back, but I'm going to quickly say to you, because, because we were talking here about how depressing it is and is there any way out, and, and I want to tell you there's a way out. We can change the system. There are ways to change the system. We can make the government work, but it's going to take very, very fundamental changes. It's going to take grassroots changes that are going to take the political system and turn it upside down. And so let, let, me, let me give you some examples uh, of what I mean. And, and by the way, who's going to do that? You're going to do it. You're going to do it. We have a system where when the people demand change, change will happen. And if you don't change, if you don't demand change, uh, it won't. So let, let me give you a couple of examples of what began to dawn on me years ago. When, when I was in Congress, I had the habit of having uh, a lot of town meetings, neighborhood meetings, meeting with, with, with constituents like this. And, and, and I might have half a dozen people there. I might have 200 people there. Uh, and, and you'd engage about the issues that were in front of Congress and, and what you were thinking. And one of those meetings, and, and actually uh, in, in the book, in the acknowledgments, I didn't dedicate it to this person, but I could have. But, but I acknowledged the person even though I don't remember his name. I don't remember, you know, what it was about. But somebody stood up in one of my town meetings, and he wanted to know, why did you not do X? You know, you're always, when you're in office, John, right? You know, somebody's always wanting, wanting to know, why did you not do X? Uh, I don't even remember what X was. And, and I did what politicians do. I said, well, I tried. You know, I, I introduced a bill. But the other party controlled Congress. The other party decided whether or not you could get bills brought forward to the floor. They decided whether or not you could have a hearing on your bill. So the other party did it, and somebody stood up in that room and said, I am so damn sick and tired of hearing Democrat this, Republican that, and everybody in the room stood up and cheered, and I never did it again. And, and later, when, when I went off and I started teaching, the one thing about, you know, it's not that you get uh, Potomac fever when you're in Washington or Charles River, you know, fever when you're in Cambridge, but, but that you have time to reflect, to think and say, how did this happen? What's not working? Why is it not working? And to look back at what you saw. And, and here's what I saw developing um, in, in Congress. It doesn't matter what the issue is. This is not going to surprise any of you at all. It doesn't matter what the issue is. It doesn't matter whether it's a tax bill, a spending bill, a Supreme Court nomination, whatever it is, there is going to be a vote, and every Democrat's going to be on one side, and every Republican's going to be on the other side. It's like we have two separate Congresses, not a United States Congress, but two, there are a Republican Congress and the Democrat Congress fighting for advantage and fighting to take credit and fighting to win uh, the next election. Well, look, you know, that didn't happen by accident. It didn't happen by accident. I, you know, I believe in the free enterprise system. I believe in incentives. Incentives work. And we have created a political system in which every incentive is to not cooperate, to not compromise, to not talk to somebody who has different ideas than your own. And you know, that's great. It, it's great to just be pure on your principle, but we are a nation of 310 million people. And we have all different backgrounds and we have all different life experiences and, and we have different ideas that we feel strongly about. The way a democracy this size has to work 
is that no matter how deeply you feel about one issue or another, at some point, you have to be able to sit down with somebody who has a different idea and find where the overlap is, find where you can give a little and get a little and get the bridges built and get the, the, the programs that a legitimate, constitutional programs that government is responsible for and make them happen. So let me tell you how we created this. By the way, uh, I, just so you don't think I'm making all this up about how bad the political party system is, uh, the, the, first, the first four presidents of the United States, they, you know, those of you who study history, you know, they, sometimes they didn't even like each other that much. But they all agreed on one thing. What did Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison all agree on? Do not create political parties. They wrote about it. They spoke about it. They said, do not create political parties. Now, they had parties. I mean, some of you who are historians, like you got to, you know, if there's a political scientist in the room, somebody's going to say, ah, but they had political parties then. Nothing like the parties they had now, that we have now. They had political parties where they came together on three or four or five issues, and that was it. And on other issues, I, I might agree with you one day and oppose you the next day. And, Tuck, I might agree with you the next day. And that, but yeah, That's the way it was. Not anymore. Not anymore. I, I was um, the uh, – when, when George W. Bush was president, the American – and the president was issuing presidential signing statements, uh, which I thought were saying he did not have to obey the law. But, you know, you're free to interpret it any way you want. Uh, but what happened was – you know, there, there was a legitimate, strong argument being made by the president's supporters in favor of why the president had to use signing statements to distance himself from legislation. There were also very strong arguments by people like me saying, well, that's unconstitutional. But So the American Bar Association uh, appointed a task force to look into these signing statements, and I was a member of that task force, and then the president of the ABA and I testified before a House committee, and guess what? Even though a good case was being made by a lot of very good lawyers that the president was within his rights to, to issue these signing statements and saying, I don't have to follow these provisions of the law, not one single Democrat, not one, saw any merit whatsoever in his argument. And even though I thought, and a lot of other people thought, that what the president was doing was clearly unconstitutional, the president saying, I don't have to obey the laws I just signed, not one Republican saw anything wrong with it. So on issue after issue, foreign policy or anything else, you know, you, you divide into these rival teams. How does that happen? First of all, there is nothing in the Constitution that creates political parties and nothing in the Constitution that creates political primaries and nothing in the, Congre in the Constitution that allows political parties, party bosses and state legislatures to draw congressional district lines. So l let me talk about a couple of those things. Uh, and, and because by identifying what the problem is, you can see where the solution is. And I do believe there are solutions. So let, let me very quickly, very quickly, just talk about the primary system. Now, I, I, you know, a lot of you in this room, I know some of you, there's a lot of you I don't know, but I know something about everybody in this room. You all believe when you go to the store, when you buy a cell phone, when you buy a book, you want choice. You want cho That's what we are. We, we want a choice in things that we get, in things that we think, in things that we watch, things that we read. We want choices. The only place where we have devised a system to stifle choice is in selecting the people who are going to decide whether we go to war, what our taxes are going to be, what programs we're going to create, because under the push of the parties, 24, well, now I'll get to that in a second. I'll get to the solution. But because of the push of the parties, almost every single state in the United States has what they call sore loser laws. Sore loser laws. And the sore loser law is that if you run in your party's primary, and you lose, you cannot be on the ballot in November. You are prevented from being on. Well, so what happens here? 
Uh, let me, I'm going to give you a couple of examples very briefly. Uh, some of you will be thinking about 